tonight on Nation to Nation. The leader of the NDP sits down for a wide-ranging interview. One of his priorities is that decisions regarding Indigenous people should be based on respecting sovereignty. These steps will be taken to respect the sovereignty of, of a First Nation and ensure that the decision will be made in such a manner that it will not be challenged in court. Liberal MP Robert falcon says the crystal meth epidemic has reached crisis levels. It has even made its way into his Winnipeg Centre office. They've assaulted uh, staff, they come in, they uh, sit down, and they'll, they sit down and they literally, uh, under when they're on, on the drug, they'll start propositioning you, uh, try and sell you stolen goods. Hello, I'm Todd Lamoran and welcome to Nation to Nation. Over a year ago, Jagmeet Singh succeeded Thomas Mulcair as leader of the federal NDP. This month, Singh appeared at the Assembly of First Nations annual December meeting, where he touted his party's progressive agenda on Indigenous rights. In particular, Romeo Saganash's private member's bill, C-262, on the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Mr. Singh joins me now. Welcome to Nation and Nation. It's an honor to be here. Now, uh, I mentioned that meeting uh, uh, last month in December at the AFN, and uh, you mentioned a lot about Indigenous rights. Why is that so important uh, as part of your par party platform? Well, for, for a number of reasons, I think we can't have uh, a, a Canada that calls itself progressive without ensuring that the nations in Canada, the nations that, are, that make up the fabric of the, the first people of this land, are not treated with as nations and don't have the rights, uh, the, right, the treaty rights, the land rights, and the recognition, the respect and dignity that they rightfully deserve. Can you give me exactly one example how Bill C-262 will change the way uh, the federal government uh, deals with or interacts with uh, Indigenous people? Sure. The, the, fundamental, the fundamental principle would be that every piece of legislation should be informed by the free, prior and informed consent principle. And just as we would work with any other nation, if there was an agreement with any nation in this world, if we were working with Sweden, for example. Any agreement with Sweden would recognize that Sweden is a sovereign nation and that any partnership would have to be informed, it would have to be done prior, and it would have to be free. And in fact, it should also go beyond that. It should be something that's mutually beneficial. And that's how we need to look at any agreement that we make with First Nations. They are sovereign nations and should ensure, in a legislative manner, a protection of their sovereign rights. Wouldn't that slow down uh, the ability of the federal government to uh, create and pass legislation though? Well, we've already seen that if we don't actually respect Indigenous sovereignty, legislation is challenged in court and it's slowed down anyways. So this would ensure that there's predictability. So if a business wants to invest in a project, Canada could ensure that this project will go ahead because it, there is a predictability, because these steps will be taken to respect the sovereignty of, of a First Nation and ensure that the decision will be made in such a manner that it will not be challenged in court because it will have respected the rights and dignity of the, of the people impacted. Uh, well, I'm going to turn to a specific piece of legislation that's promised to be tabled next uh, January and that's the uh, child welfare overhaul and child welfare legislation. Uh, I know you talked about it at the uh, Chief's Assembly, but uh, again, what's your take on that? Well, uh, it's promising to see an overhaul, but I think we can't ignore the fact that it took multiple court orders or multiple orders of the Human Rights Tribunal of Canada, that that is not how one shows respect for First Nations, uh, Métis, Inuit communities, there's no way you can claim to show respect if it takes four separate orders from the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal to then finally get to the point where you're recognizing that First Nations kids deserve equal funding to any other kid in, the, on this, uh, in this country. Uh, that is something that's concerning. The other thing is I've heard uh, First Nations at AFN uh, leadership often say this, and I think it's something that has to guide any of the legislation uh, nothing about us without us. So uh, I think that needs that spirit needs to be respected. The the primary concern, or one of the major concerns that leadership has raised with me, is that the the taking away of power and the decision making from First Nations in terms of how young people are are are, are raised and, and how they are supported. That 
the decision making around that can't come from top down, it can't come from Ottawa down, to be culturally appropriate, language appropriate, recognizing the teachings that has to be based on giving authority and decision making to Indigenous communities to make those decisions. I'm going to turn now to the inquiry into murdered and missing women. It wrapped up its community meetings uh, last week. Uh, you said at the, again at the AFN Assembly that there has to be a follow-through. Uh, what did you mean by that? Well, there's been so much work put into in terms of people who have come forward, survivors that have come forward, uh, people have been courageous in sharing their story. The, the way to honor that is to commit not to just, the, the inquiry was absolutely important, but there was obviously problems with it as well. Uh, families didn't get the support they needed. The further disrespect would be that if all this work happened, the recommendations were made, and then they weren't followed through on. We've seen many inquiries, many reports that have incredible recommendations, recommendations that could seriously and, and transformatively change lives and, and improve policy, but then they end up just collecting dust and there's no implementation. What I'm saying is there, there's got to be a commitment at the federal level that they will follow through on the recommendations and go beyond just the recommendations of the inquiry, but to include what leadership, what indigenous communities, what women's organizations um, also recommend so that we have a, a fulsome response that shows respect and isn't just uh, the lip service of having an inquiry, hearing the recommendations, and then it just is a report that they put on a shelf it collects dust, but it's not implemented. Uh, you also said, I'm again referring back to your comments you made at the AFN Assembly, you supported Senator Lillian Dick's Bill S215, which calls for harsher penalties for those who commit uh, violence against Indigenous women. Uh, isn't that at cross purposes uh, because most of the people who commit violence against Indigenous women are Indigenous men? So isn't that at the cro cross purposes of trying to get rid of the over-representation of Indigenous people in prisons, uh, won't this uh, just put more Indigenous men in prison? This Bill S215? Right. It should, it, uh, the, the Georgina Jolibá is our, is our uh, member who's been uh, very vocal on this. The principle should be that it should be taken into consideration. So the sentencing, the judge who would be assessing the, the, the sentence would assess the impact of the, a victim or someone, a victim in this case, that was indigenous, um, and that could be factored into the decision. Now, if, the, if there is an example of systemic discrimination, if there's racism, if it's uh, between, if, if the identity being indigenous woman is something that is an exacerbating factor, then it would be factored in. In cases where it's within the community, uh, that's something to be considered by the judge to see whether or not that's actually helpful in, in addressing the disproportionate uh, population of incarcerated folks who are, who are from the indigenous community, something that is, that is unacceptable, something that is wrong, something that we need to address in our justice system. It's far too um, overrepresented in terms of arrests, uh, prosecutions and incarcerations for indigenous communities as well as racialized people. There's a report that came out of Toronto that uh, just talked about Ontario, for example, that not only are racialized people more likely to be uh, incarcerated, but the report found that police are more likely to kill, 20 times more likely to kill a, in, a, in, a in a confrontation someone if they are black. So this systemic discrimination in policing is something we need to tackle as well as in our justice system as well as in incarceration rates. Uh, the NDP's social justice and environmentally friendly platform from some perspectives is seen as a job killer, uh, especially in terms of the oil and gas industry. Uh, what do you say to those First Nations who are in the industry and want to benefit, especially from the uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline exp expansion? We need to make sure that there's predictability. For, for any investment, we need to make sure that any prospective investor in any project, whatever the project may be, needs to be able to have the confidence that if they invest in a project and put forward some capital, that that project will then be, be realized and there will be a return on that income. Uh, we know that there are certain factors, though, for any project to go ahead at the federal level, we've got a responsibility to do three things. One, first and foremost, respect indigenous title rights 
uh, with a with a United a United Nations Declaration type of perspective, that making sure that that is that is a first element that is respected. Secondly, we've got to put in place environmental regulations. Otherwise, uh, corporations and investors will do whatever they want to make a profit. They will not consider the impact on the environment, the land, the air, the water. So we need to make sure that there's stringent and strong environmental protections, and then. In, in line with that, not just to protect the land, air, and water, we also make, need to make sure that the project is in line with our overall national goals on reducing our emissions. If those three things are satisfied, one, it'll be, it'll be a project that can go ahead because there won't be core challenges. And secondly, it will be a project that is in line with our vision. And I think that's important, that we've got a responsibility given the United Nations report on climate change, that if we don't reduce our emissions within 11 or 12 years, we'll be in a catastrophic climate change position, which will cost all of us, not just jobs, but also our ability to live on the planet. Uh, finally, uh, last thing I'll ask you about, you probably didn't know a lot about Indigenous issues uh, when you first became leader over a year ago. What's the one thing that has surprised you over that year? Well, I had, I had some exposure at the provincial level, but you're absolutely, you're absolutely right that that exposure has increased significantly at the, at the federal level. Uh, the thing that, that was not surprising, but the thing that I was able to really appreciate the most as, as leader is that Indigenous communities have the solutions. There are so many of the solutions of, to the problems that are faced that are solved by the communities. They actually have responses to the housing concerns. They got responses to uh, climate change and the environment. There's many of the issues that leadership and, and communities have actually come together and found solutions. It's just a lack of uh, listening to those, those, those solutions and implementing those solutions. So I think more than ever, we need to listen to the folks who are on the ground, who know the answers to the problems that they're faced with, and we need to listen and act. Uh, uh, APTN wants to have a, uh, a town hall later on uh, in the year as we get closer to the election. Is this something you think you can attend? I would love to. If it works on my schedule, we'll make it happen. Okay. On that note, uh, thank you, Mr. Singh. Uh, and, uh, thank you for talking to me. My honor. We'll have more after a short break. Welcome back. Albert Falcon Roulette is the Liberal Member of Parliament for Winnipeg Centre. He's been recently making news in an effort to combat a Beth crisis in his constituency. Roulette held a brainstorming summit in his Winnipeg office to get ideas on how to deal with meth addiction. He tried but failed to get an emergency debate in the House of Commons of the issue, and he now joins me on Nation to Nation. Mr. Roulette, welcome to Nation hey, to Nation. Hey, uh, So first off, um, how has the nature of the meth crisis changed since when you first got elected th over, just over three years ago? So the meth uh, crisis actually always existed. It was more of a low rumble. Now it's kind of, uh, it's come full blown. It's starting to uh, start reach uh, more uh, greater proportions. Uh, we're seeing a lot more petty crime, violence, um, a lot more issues in the um, health centers or the emergency wards. Um, and we're not seeing the treatment beds uh, rise in, in number to uh, try and address the issue. And we're not actually having, we didn't have a coordinated response. We're just starting there as governments to, to actually kind of address it. I've noticed a substantial change as well in the writing over the course of this past summer where it went from, you know, you heard about it to uh, really it was in your face all the time. And even in fact, in I, I, it was so in your face, I, I believe I re read uh, something that happened in your office while you were there. Yeah, people have come in. They've assaulted uh, staff. They come in. They uh, sit down, and they'll they sit down, and they literally uh, under when they're on on the drug, they'll start propositioning you, uh, trying to sell you stolen goods, uh, and uh, you know. And the issue for me is when I would call uh, or uh, you know try and get someone off the streets, uh, someone who's working in the sex trade, trying to pay for their addiction, and they're wanting to get off the streets. I could never actually locate services on a Friday afternoon or a Wednesday afternoon. It seemed that you know it was more of a you know if it was during the day maybe I might be able to get something for someone, but if you were in the evening, you know there was no services available for anyone. I mentioned in my intro about a barnstorming uh, session you held yeah. in your constituency office back in uh, November. Uh, what were you hoping for when you held that summit in your office? Uh, I guess what was the best idea to come out of there? 
Well, one, I wanted to raise awareness and continue to push government, my government as well as the provincial government especially, because they have a major role to play in this, but uh, also to get a greater understanding of the people who are actually on the ground dealing with this oh, uh, day after day, trying to understand what it is that we should be doing. Because as politicians, we often come up with our predetermined, you know, we need to more policing, uh, you know, safe injection site. And uh, that's kind of what I went in thinking, what I was going to hear. And instead, what I heard um, was we need more recreation to deal with the young people, to keep them interested in doing other things, especially, uh, you know, we heard a statistics from a uh, health worker from the Winnipeg Regional Health Authority who said if we can get someone to not take drugs between the ages of 14 to 16, they're uh, less likely to take the drugs later on and less likely to develop an addiction. Uh, even though they might use drugs later on in their life. And so this is, uh, you know, that was a startling stat. Uh, and, uh, you know, as you know, it's very hard sometimes to obtain recreation services in the downtown core because, you know, it's a payer user system. You know, you have to show up with cash and have some money in order to use that. And that's not, sometimes not fair to very uh, poor families or pam families which might not have as much means as others uh, to, to go to a YMCA. And so I think we need to be more creative. And this is actually what I heard from youth groups who were involved in the summit, uh, homeless shelters. For instance, there's actually no uh, programs for people who are homeless. There's 1,500 homeless people uh, in the city, but there's no recreation program geared toward them, towards them. Yet in the downtown core, we just built, uh, we gave $30 million to build the uh, sports center, uh, you know, for high-end athletes. Yet just right next door is Salon Mission, Main Street Project, Salvation Army, and there's no gyms for any of the people who might be living on the streets to go and have do something positive, uh, some recreation, sports, move around, play with balls, be coached, uh, something to, uh, that uh, will build their spirit. Uh, of course, you can't do this alone. Health is usually a provincial responsibility. You asked uh, the health minister, Cameron Friesen, to come. He didn't show up. His representative didn't show up. So I suppose, uh, uh, how seriously is the Manitoba government taking this, do you think? Well, I think they are taking it seriously, but I think they're also very nervous because they don't want to have uh, increased expectations. I think they're very worried if they uh, say that uh, they recognize that there's a problem, then they might have to be forced to find funds in order to fund it. Uh, just recently on Friday, the federal government gave $4.2 million uh, in a funding announcement that I participated into the province in order to help fund more beds and treatment. Uh, we weren't able to get a number out of the province specifically on the number of beds, you know, just greater capacity. But we know this is a, a math, for instance, is an addiction which doesn't just impact for 28 days uh, for withdrawal. You know, this is a three-month process to get someone off uh, of an addiction to meth. And that requires not only a bed, but a bed for three months, not just uh, a 30-day period or 28-day period, which is usually. Right now in Manitoba, we have an eight-week waiting period from what I've heard from the Addictions Foundation in Manitoba. You know, we've seen, you know, the health crisis uh, in the ER. And a lot of this impacts people who are Indigenous, who are poor, uh, and uh, people who are suffering even, you know, a lot of mental health issues. You know, when, when you're on the streets or when you're, when you're suffering a crisis and you just don't feel, you know, good and you can take meth, the high apparently is extremely, um, it's, it's, a, it's a high which, you know, just gets you in, in the place that, you know, you probably wouldn't usually, usually get very easily. And it lasts for an awful, awful long time, 12 to 16 hours. It, uh, and because it feels so good and it lasts so long, you want to take it again, and it becomes very, very addictive. And right now, it's very cheap to obtain this. Uh, you know, I'm trying to work with uh, Ralph Goodale, the Minister of Public Security, to ensure that we're strengthening our borders. Uh, right now, they've committed another $50 million to trying to make sure that we're monitoring what uh, the drugs are coming in from Mexico, apparently, and trying to work also with our Chinese and India counterparts to ensure that the ingredients aren't coming through Mexico, where they're, where they're being imported, produced into meth in large labs and then shipped into, into Winnipeg and through, uh, throughout the prairies and going really into indigenous communities. Um, I know that uh, last month you tried to get an emergency, de emergency debate on this in the House of Commons. The Speaker of the House turned you down. Uh, but the Standing Committee on Health has started to look at this. Uh, they, I think in late November, started to uh, uh, look at this issue, the meth crisis in Canada. Uh, what are you expecting out of that committee? And uh, furthermore, are you satisfied with what your government is doing on the meth crisis? Well, I'm, I'm not satisfied uh, yet with what we're doing as governments because it is a, a municipal, a provincial, and federal issue. So we really need all governments really working together. And this is going to take a long time to uh, find out what it is we should actually be doing in, uh, for you know, addiction issues, not only uh, short term with a meth crisis, but we have often a cycle of addiction issues that come forward in our society. Um, 
the health committee I participate in, so we've heard startling testimony uh, from healthcare professionals who have been assaulted, uh, requiring more, needing more security in our ERs, the province not responding quite uh, fast enough to provide that security, uh, healthcare professionals wondering why we treat meth addiction at the ER, maybe we should have a specific facility or place to do that with people who are specifically trained in what they should be doing uh, with people who are addicted to meth. Uh, but also, uh, you know, our government could be doing more. Uh, but we've also uh, just uh, recently uh, held the debate, uh, a take note debate. We have two per session. And the take note debate uh, was about looking at the opioid uh, crisis and, and addiction issues. And in this case as well as meth was also involved in this uh, debate. And it's an opportunity for parliamentarians to, in a very fast uh, and furious way, to question the health minister, uh, to find out what it is that, uh, that she's doing. And I know the 150 50 million is being invested across Canada and they're trying to sign bilateral agreements. But I really want to make sure that we get ahead of this issue uh, before it starts spreading to other provinces. I know in Vancouver from testimony at the Health St uh, Standing Committee uh, that 52% uh, of people using safe injection sites are now using it for meth-related uh, drugs. Uh, this is a problem, and if we don't address it, the problems are meth are, are much greater than opioids because of the psychosis, because of the violence that's uh, sometimes associated with it, and, uh, and it causes a lot of disruption in society. It causes disruption when you walk down the street if someone's on having a psychotic episode with the police because you have to call out a number of police officers in, in order to try and arrest the person. Um, if they have committed a crime, you can take them to jail, but if they're just having a psychotic episode and they haven't done anything wrong yet, you have to take them to the hospital. At the hospital, it causes chaos because, well, you know, you, nurses don't want to be insulted, assaulted. They're very, uh, sometimes some of them are Filipinos, uh, you know, indigenous. Uh, others are, you know, from all society. They're smaller, often women, and uh, no one wants to go to work to get hurt. And there are nurses that are getting hurt and other healthcare professionals. And I think this is, um, this is a major, major problem that if we don't come to heads with it in Winnipeg, it's going to spread and go into places like Toronto, Montreal, and out in Halifax, because meth is also a very, uh, uh, it's a very cheap, cheap drug to obtain. And think of the crisis we could have in Indigenous communities. Well, it doesn't sound like it's as romantic as uh, that uh, show Breaking Bad made it out to look. <laughs> uh, I want to thank you, uh, Mr. Roulette, uh, for coming in and talking to us. Thank oh, you. Uh, tapu hi, hi. We'll have more after a short break. Next week, our show goes on holiday. We'll be back on January 3rd with our political panel of MPs. They'll be debating whether the overhaul of child welfare and an Indigenous Languages Act will actually happen. Prime Minister announced legislation will be tabled next month, but will they get passed into law? Time is short before the next election campaign heats up. Here's a preview. Well, this is all systems go. These are two extremely important pieces of legislation. Uh, that go to the very core of identity uh, in the case of uh, the child welfare uh, and services reform uh, package that's going to be put through. This is, this is something that, that, that will uh, we'll, we'll start to put an end to, to what is in effect another, another scoop. But until you actually see what's tabled, you can't um, you know, fully say that we're behind this. So we're behind the concept, absolutely. We will not stand in the way of it progressing, but we're going to do our job in terms of you know, what the legislation actually looks like. But I have to point out that we only have 14 weeks left. And if you missed any part of tonight's show, you can check out our podcasts. Go to aptnnews.ca slash podcast. This is our last show before the holidays. So on behalf of myself and everyone else who works here on Nation to Nation, thanks for watching and have a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.